Welcome to Fairhaven Baptist Church and the commencement services for Fairhaven Christian Academy and Fairhaven Baptist College. While we're here for commencement exercises, it is the commencement of a school and college that is part of a church, and much of this evening will be just like a church service. So we need to be respectful. Please refrain from walking in and out, uh, answering cell phones. You might take this moment to make sure that it's off and not going to disrupt the uh, ceremony and the service, taking pictures, videos, disturbing, dis or in other ways, disturbing the service in any way. There'll be plenty of time afterward to use our cameras. Tonight you'll hear some musical performances. Students will be receiving awards, certificates, diplomas, degrees, and some students will be giving testimonies of how God helped and strengthened them during their time of schooling. It is appropriate to congratulate the students at the proper time, but if you'd like to praise God with them, a hearty amen or praise the Lord is a good way to do that. We've tried to group the various parts of tonight's service in this way. We'll begin with some performances and award presentations, and you are, of course, welcome to applaud during this time if you desire. We will then have some testimonies from students, from graduates, an offering time with a special arrangement of a sacred song, some other sacred singing, and a sermon from God's word. During this portion, we ask that you do not applaud. And then at the end, we will present all the graduates for their respective diplomas and, and degrees. Please stand with me now as we sing our national anthem. Oh. In just a moment, we'll have uh, Dr. Mitchell open us in a word of prayer. Uh, Dr. Vogelin gave us a little bit of instruction. Hopefully, you got that down. There is a couple of spots that we, we do clap. We appreciate the hard work that our students have done. And so you'll see that a couple of times, and you can kind of follow our lead on the platform. I've tried to tell our church this. It's kind of hard to say amen after a John Philip Sousa march. And so we'll probably clap after that or... It's kind of hard to say amen to Felix Mendelssohn, uh, so we'll probably clap after that. But when students are given a testimony, uh, that's where it's just good to say amen. I appreciate uh, the words that uh, they uh, bring, and most of it is heartfelt, and, and a lot of it is not really praise to our academy, but it's praise to the Lord for what he's done in their lives. And so just kind of follow our lead in those things. We appreciate uh, the parents that were able to make it out uh, to maybe your son or daughter is graduating, but it could be that you have a undergraduate that uh, is just you're coming to take them home, and we appreciate that you will take them away from us. And so we, <laughs> as as uh, Pastor Williams, what did you say? It's yeah, nice to see him come, nice to see him go. All right, but uh, we appreciate you coming taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. Uh, Dr. Jerry Mitchell is uh, Dean of Music at our Bible College, and so he's gonna open us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a special evening. Thank you, God, for just uh, all that this evening represents. We have so much 
to be grateful for here tonight. What a privilege it has been to work with these young people, walking investments, um, people that parents have prayed over, grandparents have uh, uh, cried over, Lord, uh, pastors uh, entrusted into our care, Lord. I, we just thank you for that, Lord, each one fearfully and wonderfully made. And now, Lord, uh, tonight, many of them stand on the brink of new and exciting chapters of their lives, yet unopened. And yet, Lord, we know that you know what the future holds. So I pray, Lord, that each one of them would fear to take a step without the light of your word cast upon those steps. But at the same time, there would be an excitement to see what you have out there for them. Lord, you know that we did what we could to equip them, but that is not enough. We don't intend to send out just lives that are equipped, Lord, but what you know that we've urged them to very carefully, day by day, climb into your hands so that they might not only be equipped lives, but empowered lives, relying on you, Lord, to do the work that you have for them. They've already been a blessing to us, Lord, but the uh, story is not yet finished. Help them go forth and continue to be a blessing to others. Be with us this evening as these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. While we want to maintain the serious nature of a church service, there is, these are commencement exercises, and most likely you've not heard music like we have planned for tonight in church recently. For many years, we have prepared a special song in three categories for our graduation service. And the first category is a patriotic or march selection. We are grateful that in his providence, God placed us here in America. As Americans, we believe it is proper to teach our children to have a Christian view and appreciation for the country that he has given us. And our selection in this category tonight is Corcoran Cadets March by John Philip Sousa. The Corcoran Cadets drill team was the favorite of Washington, D.C., since they were the most notable of the many drill teams that flourished there after the Civil War. Their average age was 16 and they presented quite a snappy picture with colorful uniforms, wooden rifles, and youthful enthusiasm in all their routines. The Corcoran Cadets were the first to be mustered into the National Guard, and they had a strong spree de corps. Their Veterans Association held reunions for many years, they had their own band, and it seems like they requested that John Philip Sousa write a march for them. Sousa presented this march to the officers and men of the Corcoran Cadets. Please enjoy our high school orchestra as they play Corcoran Cadets March.
this point, I'd like to recognize some students for some awards and uh, things from the school year. Uh, the first set of awards, uh, the first thing to recognize is valedictorian and salutatorian of the senior class. This is just a straight grade calculation. Um, before I forget, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll announce several and we'll get them down front. We'll give them a round of applause once they're all, all down front. So, uh, This year for the senior class, uh, salutatorian is Mandy Brader. She should be behind me. And valedictorian is Emily Reinhardt. The next award I'd like to mention is the American Christian Honor Society. Uh, the American Christian Honor Society is a function of the American Association of Christian Schools. This society is open for students in 10th through 12th grade who have an excellent academic record, have a good Christian testimony in and out of school, and exercise student leadership. Uh, these students are selected by the pastoral and administrative staff. Uh, this year we have two students uh, to recognize for the American Christian Honor Society. Uh, the first one is Mandy Brader, and the second is Andrew Schreiber. The third award is something we call Christian Character, the Christian Character Award. Uh, this is given to a student who demonstrates superior Christian character. Uh, this can be seen through Christian leadership amongst the student body, through maintaining a good testimony before their peers and teachers, faithful completion of academic requirements, and service to God through the local church. There's a three-step selection process for this award. Uh, the first is the students nominate fellow students for the award. Uh, the second step is the teachers giving their opinions about those who have been nominated. And then the third step is the pastoral and administrative staff uh, making the final decision. Uh, in addition to the certificate that Dr. Vogelin has down there, there's also a $150 cash prize uh, that goes along with this one. Uh, this year we have one student to recognize for the Christian Character Award, and that is Emily Reinhardt. Let's give them a round of applause. The next piece of music we'll play is a classical uh, selection, and there's a wealth of challenging music that I can choose from to stretch the abilities God has given us uh, in, in classical music. Our classical selection is the finale from Felix Mendelssohn's Symphony No. 3. Felix Mendelssohn was a gifted musician uh, from a very young age. When, his, uh, when he was a child, his Jewish family converted to Christianity and his parents encouraged his education in the arts, including painting and music. And as it turns out, Mendelssohn is remembered uh, much more for his depictions of scenery with music than his visual depictions of scenery with, with paintings. A trip to Scotland is what sparked the creation of his third symphony, um, just as a visit to, uh, uh, to Italy sparked the creation of his fourth symphony. He finished his fourth symphony before his third. And um, there, there seems to be, maybe for this reason that I'm going to say, there seems to be less of Scotland in the symphony, uh, the third one, than there is of Italy in his fourth symphony. Sim in his fourth symphony. And that could be, be because he finished his fourth symphony while sunny Italy was still in its recent memory. But it took him over 10 years to finish his third symphony. He'd been long gone from Scotland. But what he would do is he would go around, he'd see a scenery and it'd inspire something. He'd write a couple notes down on a piece of paper and say, I'd like instruments like this to play it. And 13 years later, he turned it into a symphony. The finale, which is the part that we're going to play with its warlike horns, is thought to picture the gathering of the Scottish clans. The whole symphony, uh, in the whole symphony, this part is a special ending that isn't clearly related to the rest of the piece, though of course, uh, the composer thought it was the best way to finish the symphony. Thank you. 
James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Hello, my name is Emily Reinhardt, and I've had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home that is heavily involved in this church and its ministries. One of the many good and perfect gifts God has given me is a wonderful Christian education. I have been able to attend Fairhaven Christian Academy since age three, and have enjoyed its many benefits and privileges. I've made many great memories from school of the year, over the years, from Mr. Um, Edwards cracking an egg over Elisha's head on parent day in first grade, to shooting off rockets and building bridges with Mr. Kelso in senior engineering. I've made many great memories from our school's extensive candy cell, where I've been able to go many places and meet many, many new people. I've also greatly enjoyed our girls' intramural, intramural program. It's definitely not as intense or competitive as the guys' sports programs, but it is very enjoyable for those who are able to participate. We were able to compete in many different activities, but my favorite are the swimming and volleyball program. Um, through these different sports, I've been able to learn to push myself individually, but also the importance of working together with my teammates. I also have many great memories from this church's youth group. I have many memories of the crazy teen activities where we had to come up with bizarre costumes to match whatever theme Pastor Parrish had dreamed up for the night. But I also have many memories of the great sermons and lessons that I heard that were designed specifically for me. and. Uh, from people whose whole purpose in life was to help me grow and develop as a young person. God has blessed our schools in many different ways, including many wonderful teachers, as well as an amazing principal. I think he's just the most amazing principal we've ever had. He's also my dad, so that might make me a little bit biased. But in all reality, God has blessed our schools with amazing teachers and staff who help keep this school running. The teachers at this school are passionate about their subjects. They make you feel like if you don't get everything out of their class, your education has been worthless. And with teachers like this, it's impossible not to learn. And I thank each and every one of them who put so much time and effort into my life. I also have to say a big thank you to all the people, members of this church who help support this school. Without Fairhaven um, Baptist Church, Fairhaven Christian Academy could not exist. And I have to say thank you to each and every person who gives their tithes and offerings each week and prays for the continuance of this school. As I look back, I can see many different lessons that I have learned, but probably the most important one is that the Bible should be the most important thing in my life. 
I love to read and spend as much time reading as I can, but I have learned that the Bible should be the most important book. As I said, our teachers are very passionate about what they teach, but they also are passionate about making sure what they teach is from a biblical, biblical perspective. Every class that you're in, you see the Bible tied into each subject. In uh, literature class, I have learned biblical principles for what I should be reading and tests that I can um, test what I'm reading according to. Um, I've also, in speech class, I've learned what God has to say about how I should be speaking and how I can use what I say to serve him better. Even um, in history class, as you've all heard, it's his story. I learned that it's not just a chain of random events, but it's God's perfect plan being worked out in individuals' lives. And even in math and science, where you might not think the Bible could be tied in, you can see God's amazing creativity and power in the world that he's created and the um, infinite detailedness of his mind through mathematics. As I um, finish up my high school career, I am um, very thankful for what I've learned, and I'm looking forward to what God has for me in the future. I plan to um, attend Fairhaven Baptist College and study secondary education. I'll be majoring in math and science, and I'm looking forward to learning more from some of the same great teachers I've already had. Over the summer, I'll continue to, continue to be a part of the various ministries I'm involved in and also be working as much as possible to save for college. The next few years contain many changes that can be a little bit scary to think about. But James 1.17 not only reminds me of many, God's many good and perfect gifts, but also that God will never change. As the verse says, there is no variableness with him. No matter where I go or what I do, God will always be the same. People I know and trust might change or fail me, but God has promised that he never will. It's amazing to know that this unchanging God has a plan for my life and that if I trust him, he can do things through me that I never could on my own. Thank you. We made it. At least we're all sitting there hoping that our diplomas are sitting over there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mike Santusi. When I first came here as a freshman, I remember finishing up my first year and sitting in the crowd through my first graduation here. And all I could think as I watched those seniors give their testimonies is, man, I cannot wait to get up there because I'm going to let them have it. However, that's not the attitude I come up here today with. I do not have a background or of a family or even of a church that's familiar with the college here. The only way I found out about Fairhaven was simply by the graduates that had come out to my church to preach to different things and camps. By their testimonies that were reflected just in the short time that I saw them, I saw a difference in Fairhaven graduates versus other college graduates that I had seen. They had a seriousness about God's word, and they had a work ethic that was unmatchable. They impressed me in such a way that even though I wasn't real sure of what God had for me, I knew Fairhaven was a place to be serious about God's work. I was saved at 10 years old, right after junior church. I remember hearing about sin and the penalty of it, and I ran to my parents right after and said, I need to be saved. And they took me aside into the small teen room of our church and led me through a few Bible verses. But I already knew what I needed to do. And that's where I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I praise God every day for my salvation. Though it may not seem miraculous to most, I look back on many times in my life where without it, I would not be here tonight. I had several people and things in my life to help me to this moment tonight. My parents are first because they found an importance in making sure that we all took church and academics very seriously. I would not be here if it were not for my mother's glare that I could feel across the auditorium, making sure I was sitting up and listening. I also would not be here without the full support that they gave me. I am so thankful to God for a good home to be raised in and also a good church to be rooted in. My pastor, Pastor Fryman, made it his duty to make time for me and my family in order to see us grow, and he continues to do that even now. I remember his warnings before I came to school about how so many of his friends didn't make it through Bible college. I remember committing right then in my own heart that that would not be said of me. Thank God for a faithful and also a patient pastor. I'm so grateful also of so many of you that went out of your way to make a small difference in my life without even knowing it. 
And also, I cannot go without mentioning my loving wife that in this past year endured me being gone all day with school, all day with work, and just faithfully took care of things at home and faithfully showed me the love and support that I needed. I've learned many lessons while here, some in class and some out of class. I've already put a lot of what I've learned to use in different situations and ministries that God has placed me in. God has used the teaching here to better my character and also to give me the tools that I need as I go out. There's so much that I could say about what I've learned here, but I would not have learned nearly as much if it were not for the character that this school implements into its students. Students that are here now are continuing on. The rules may, or rather will, seem ridiculous at times. But as every good alumni has said, they're not nearly as strict as what they used to be. <laughs> However, student that remains, whether the, the rules be strict or not, take the time here to build some personal character above and beyond those rules, because that is what will help you the most. Many graduates, I'm sure, will tell you about the rules that they took to heart and how they helped them through the hardest times. Learn to study and learn your subjects because you'll definitely use those. But do not forsake your character in doing so. Also, something I found priceless while here are good friends. Good friends that will tell you when you're wrong, laugh with you when you need it, and maybe even remind you about that paper that's due tomorrow. Good godly friends have been so much of a blessing to me. Proverbs 27 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And I'm thankful for friends that were not afraid to wound me for my own sake. Also, I cannot go without thanking the staff that have sacrificed so much just so that we can learn and grow for the Lord. As I move on from this place, I will continue my training under my pastor in Maslin, Ohio as his pastoral assistant, while also having the opportunity of helping a man in our church start up a new work not too far from us. I'm so excited for what the Lord has for us. However, I cannot forget the love, the labor, and the sacrifice that was poured into me, even from the first time that I showed up. As I walked onto campus as a freshman, I remember so many people coming up to me who I had never seen before and knowing me by name. I knew right then that this was a place that cared about its students. Now as I look back on my four years here, I see that this is also a place being used of God because it has people that are willing to sacrifice, willing to love and labor, and also pray for it. So whether your part was teaching us while we yawned uncontrollably at 7.30 in the morning, or maybe giving a Bible lesson in the middle of music theory, or giving to the church and college when no one saw it. Or maybe you're taking the time to pray for us. Or teaching a subject that no one would ever want to teach. Or even just giving a kind word that you didn't realize meant so much. All I have to say is thank you. Just a moment, we're gonna take what we call our graduation offering. We started this a couple of years ago. And we're not really great at uh, doing offerings. There's some folks, I think there's uh, one college that this year, their graduation offering, they're gonna, I think they're heading for a million dollars. So if you guys wanna do half of that, I would uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know, but I've, I've heard of, they, they have a lot of pastors come in and they, they kinda are standing up, uh, putting them on the spot. And then I got, I was sitting up here and noticing there's a few pastors and I, I was thinking, wow, I could do that too right now, but uh, we're not going to do that. But um, our, our college and our academy, our church undergirds a lot of the finances, and so our academy is very reasonable. Uh, you could ask our principal about that. Most of the schools locally, private schools, are double, uh, some of them triple, of what, uh, what we charge, and a lot of that is because uh, our church folks uh, undergird a lot of the finances and I, I appreciate that and then also in the college we believe in the college where we're a preacher boys college and we love training folks for full-time service and that's our primary goal we don't we don't have uh, cosmetology or HVAC or mechanics or all kinds of, you know it's 
you need some of those uh, degrees and you need engineers and you need lawyers uh, and different things like that. But we train for full-time service and solely for that. We want uh, them to, and you can come get a, a one-year Bible certificate and that Bible certificate is gonna be uh, geared towards uh, then a lot of Bible theology or you can also get it in music and it's to go back and help in a church so that they can be an asset in that church in the area of full-time work. So that's our goal, our focus. Uh, we forgot to put the graph into the sheet. Uh, we uh, have had it the last couple years, but we're trying to raise right around $18,000. And uh, sometimes we hit it, sometimes we don't. But what we try to do is use that on the property to help fund uh, some projects uh, the, the kids eat in the dining room and the, the many uh, flops of their food on that carpet uh, has been stepped on and pressed upon uh, much. And so our carpet is in disarray and in need of repair. And so we have projects like that that we try to raise the funds so that we can do some, uh, some of those projects. Right now, uh, already, uh, because of gifts that have been given, we're already at $3,000. And so I praise the Lord for that. But uh, ushers, if you want to make your way down, and in just a moment, Dr. Vogel will introduce the offertory. And at, at this stage, we start transitioning into our uh, sacred, I say our sacred um, service or into that uh, area that is more church oriented. And so our offertory is uh, a, a sacred song. And so he'll explain some of that. But we do appreciate uh, all of you guys, and if you are in any ways able to help us in this graduation offering, we would thank you for that. And, and like I said, in just a moment, he's going to introduce this. I wanted to mention to our church family, I wanted to say a big thank you to all the folks that helped out with our Mother's Day brunch. Uh, we had a number of folks come out. We had a lot of visitors, a lot of moms that came out on Sunday, and I thank you for that work. And then uh, the Mother's Day brunch, we seated, I think, 258 down in the dining room, and there was a whole lot of grub that went down. And uh, But we also, we had a number of folks walk the aisles, but I know we had two moms, um, two, two moms that got saved on Sunday. And uh, the one mom was sitting up on the balcony, and she's been coming for a little bit, and she, um, she made her way all the way down to the altar in the uh, morning service. So I wanted to thank you for your work, and um, I know sometimes, uh, and especially ladies, uh, it just it meant a lot to me because it's Mother's Day. It's it's your day, and you set that aside so that souls could be saved. And I really appreciate that. Dr. Roglin is going to introduce our offertory piece. Our offering selection is an arrangement of "Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus" by Randall Standridge titled In Simple Faith. Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus was written by a most remarkable woman, Louisa Stead, out of one of her darkest hours, the tragic drowning of her husband. Louisa was born in 1850 in Dover, England. As a young girl, she felt burdened to serve God in missionary service. She came to America in 1871 and lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then in 1875, she married Mr. Stead. They had a daughter, Lily, and when Lily was four years old, the family decided to enjoy the sunny beach at Long Island Sound, New York. While eating their picnic, they suddenly heard cries of help and spotted a drowning boy in the sea. Mr. Stead charged into the water to save him. As often happens, however, the struggling boy pulled his rescuer under the water with him and both drowned before the terrified eyes of wife and daughter. Out of her why struggle with God during the following days flowed these meaningful words from the soul of Louisa Stead. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. The fourth stanza says, I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. A short time later, Louisa and her daughter left for South Africa, where she served in missionary work for 15 years. And during this time, she married Robert Wodehouse. 
after recouping her health for five years from 1895 to 1900, she returned to Africa and the country of Rhodesia where she served until her death in 1917. William Kirkpatrick, a prolific composer of Christian songs and hymns, wrote the music to Louisa's poem, and this arrangement of the music by Randall Standridge well conveys the feelings of peace that comes when we trust in Jesus. Let's pray together as we receive our offering. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, and we thank you for the comfort that we can have in times of struggle and trial because we know you, your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and the peace that we can have as we go through whatever trial may come our way. We thank you for our school and for the college, and we thank you for this opportunity tonight to remember and recognize the things that you've done in our lives through this past year and through the, uh, through the education of those that are graduating. And at this time, we thank you for the, the goodness you've given to us and the opportunity to uh, give back some of that to you to help the work here at our church. We pray you'd be pleased and glorified by all that's done through the rest of this evening, in Jesus' name, amen.
Please stand with me now as we sing the song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. In our hymnal, it's number 257. It's also in your program if you need the words. And also, so there's no confusion, you should know that if you have to leave in the preaching service that's going to, in the sermon that's going to be here in just a few minutes, we'll have some chairs reserved in the back so that you don't need to further disrupt the service. Number 257, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Promise just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to me with 
Our speaker this evening, and he was with us last night, and if you missed that, I think you can look it up on our website, but Pastor Larry Williams uh, spoke to the student body at our closing chapel last night. He was part of our first graduating class in 1980, just a few years ago, and uh, in 1981, he moved to Seneca, Pennsylvania, and he was moving there to be the assistant pastor at Faith Baptist Church. And about two years later, he became the pastor. And so he's been the pastor there at Faith Baptist Church. And when he uh, took over and as pastor, they were meeting together in a rented Grange Hall. And uh, I've been out there uh, and am heading out there, I think, this, this summer again. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful facility. And I know uh, he would attribute that to God. Uh, God is blessed, and God has blessed his work and his ministry, and what I love about Pastor Larry Williams is that he loves the Word of God, and uh, he reveres the Word of God and preaches strong from the Word of God, and it has held him steady, uh, steady all these years, and I thought it would be a great challenge to our graduates especially to see uh, a man that is still uh, at it, faithful, faithful to the Word of God, faithful to the ministry, uh, many, many years later, and hopefully it could challenge them. Uh, hopefully in, later in their life, it can be said of them that they are still holding true to the word of God. So he's going to come and speak at this time. Well, thank you, Pastor Dem. appreciate that. And uh, before I get started, I, my allergies are acting up. And so I've got a very dry mouth tonight. And last night I about petered out about halfway through. So I'm going to take a drink here first. But it's a great joy to be here tonight, and uh, graduates, we congratulate you for this milestone in your lives. And as Pastor Dameron said, 39 years, it actually be 39 years ago, May 22nd, that we graduated here, and I sat down. There were four of us that year, 
And, uh, you know, we were here about, about nine months afterwards, and I got a call from a pastor starting a church out in Seneca, Pennsylvania. It's not a place you find by action. You have to be told how to get there. It's a pretty small place, about 1,000 people. But anyway, um, he had asked, the gentleman asked if I would come and be the assistant pastor. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, I said, well, I'll pray about it. And uh, I prayed about it, prayed about it, couldn't decide what the Lord would have me to do. And, and uh, so actually back there, I was telling some of the guys before the service, back there in the conference room, I took a Friday afternoon after, out from work. I'd been praying and fasting off and on for a few days about that. I thought, God, I get this settled. And I went back there and took that afternoon, prayed, and asked God, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and uh, I actually took a piece of, maybe it's a little spiritual now, but I took a piece of paper and wrote down the reasons why I should go to Seneca and the reasons I should not go. And the reasons I should not go to Seneca were like, I don't know anybody there. And, uh, you know, um, and the Lord said to me, uh, you know, I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, and I said, I'll have to work. I don't have a job. And then God said to me, not audibly, but uh, in my spirit and through his word, for my God to supply all your need according to which is in Christ Jesus. And I said, Lord, okay, I'll go. So I surrendered back there to go to Seneca uh, 39 years ago. It doesn't seem possible already. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for the training I got at Fairhaven. They put some grit and stick in me. It's allowed me to make it all these years in Seneca. By the way, I have to say, first and foremost, the grace of God enabled me to stay there. But I did learn some things here uh, that made a great difference in my life. And uh, I tell folks at our church, I don't have a backup gear. You know, the garbage truck, me, 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 I don't have one of those. And uh, once I commit myself to something, we see it till we don't give up until the job is done. God's honored that over the years, in spite of the difficulties and hardships. And we've had those over the years in Seneca. And I said, it's like chiseling something out of granite there where we're at. I suppose it's that way every place, really, you think about it. But, uh, you know, God's enabled us to uh, keep on keeping on. There have been times we didn't think we could go on, but the grace of God enabled us to take another step, just keep on praying, keep on working, keep on preaching, and the clouds usually lift. They always lift sooner or later. Some storms last longer than others, but they always lift. So I have a special place in my heart for Fairhaven Baptist College. I didn't realize 39 years ago I'd be here preaching for graduation, but isn't God a good boss? <laughs> He's a great boss. He's a great boss. Take your Bibles and go to 2 Kings chapter 2. You didn't come to hear me tell stories all the few along the way because a lot of things remind me of stories in my life. But I've earned all of them, amen. But 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. But while you're turning there, if you heard about this old couple that walked into McDonald's one day, and probably like my wife and I, an old couple, you know, I think older than we were, but they walk in there and uh, the, uh, the uh, husband orders a... Uh, a quarter, a quarter pounder meal. So he uh, gets that, and then, uh, of course, he has a burger and some fries and a soft drink, and they go back to the table, he and his wife, and they both sit down, and the husband uh, takes out a knife, and he cuts the uh, quarter pounder in half and gives half to his wife, and then he uh, counts all the fries out, gives his wife the same amount of fries as what he had, and he begins to eat. And uh, another gentleman saw him. Don't laugh, I'm not done yet here. But uh, anyway, a gentleman sees him and comes over and says, hey, I see you only got one, uh, one uh, uh, quarter pounder milk. Will you buy another one? He said, no, thanks. We share everything. And so, uh, you know, he's eating his uh, quarter pounder and uh, eating his fries, and she keeps sipping on the drink. And someone else comes over and says, hey, uh, we saw that you're only eating, uh, you know, meal, one meal, ordered one meal. Could we order you another? No, thanks. We share everything. Well, the gentleman keeps eating. He finally finishes up his uh, fries, and he finishes up his hamburger. And she's sipping on a drink there a little bit, and someone comes up and says to the lady, what are you waiting for? She says, the teeth, we share everything. <laughs> now, I do want to set you at rest tonight. We do not share teeth, and we do not share toothbrushes, amen. We share everything? Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> a lot of things, but we don't share our teeth, and we don't share a toothbrush. Second Kings chapter 2, look at verse 1, if you would. And it came to pass, great portion of Scripture, so much here. And, uh, but when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha to Gilgal. If you're right in your Bible, I told the uh, students last night, I want you to circle a couple things. We're going to come back and visit these places in our mind. That is, but Gilgal, circle the word Gilgal, it's significant. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord shall send me to Bethel. Circle the word Bethel. If you write in your Bible, if you don't, don't, but I do. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha 
and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. I think he said these words really, Don't, don't remind me. That's how we'd say it. Don't remind me. I know he's going. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, uh, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. Circle the word Jericho. That's a significant place. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as my, thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Don't remind me. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Circle the word Jordan. That's significant. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar. You know, I wrote down in my Bible here, spectators, and there's far too many spectators in, in the Christian realm. And graduates, I pray to God you'll not be a spectator wherever God would call you to go. We don't need any more spectators. We need folks involved. It says there, at the view far off, and they too stood by Jordan, and Elijah took his mantle, we kind of like a, like a sport coat or something today, and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, and so they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and a horses uh, of fire parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up to heaven, or said, went up rather by a whirlwind into heaven. When I was in high school, and I'm getting a little historical as I get older, I get a lot of, I get historical a lot, but I, I was involved in the athletic uh, programs, and the fall I played on the football team, and, and uh, right guard and sometimes linebacker, and I kind of had a motto back in those days, if it moves, it's down. Now today they call that the toxic male instinct, that, you know, but I think that's good in some way because uh, unfortunately a lot of American men are being feminized. And there ought to be a definite difference between men and women, amen, and men ought to be masculine. And, but I always like the rough and tumble of football. During the winter months, I was on the wrestling team. And I know Fairman did a wrestling team for years here, but wrestling was my favorite sport because I liked the individual competition. I like to tie people up in knots and torch them a little bit, amen, before you pin them, amen, or you stick them to the mat. That's that toxic male instinct again, you know, and I haven't gotten over it altogether in spring. It was, I was actually part of the track team, not because I liked track, but because it was good conditioning for football, most of all for wrestling. So that's why I went out for track. And uh, on the track team, uh, you know, I threw the discus. I know I'm pretty small to throw the discus, but no one else volunteered, so I volunteered to throw the discus. I also ran in the 880 relay, a team comprised, of course, of four players, each running 220 yards. Simple math, amen. And when you, uh, you ran your 220 yards, you handed off the baton to the next player, and he ran 220 yards, and of course, they passed the next player until 880 yards was complete. Now, we all know what a baton is, but our tons were made of round aluminum. Uh, I suppose about a foot long, maybe something like that, and about maybe an inch and a quarter round. And we wrapped tape on the ends of the baton. So as, as you ran, you had a better chance of gripping it and not dropping it. So once you got the baton, you ran for all you were worth. And the last thing you wanted to do was to drop the baton. If you dropped the baton, your team would be sure to lose. You didn't want to drop it. In our text today, the spiritual baton of Elijah is passing to the hands of Elisha. Ten years prior to our text today, Elijah cast his mantle upon Elisha or chose him as his successor. And so for ten years, Elijah has been preparing a successor to take the baton. Ten years, and the day has finally come, and Elijah passes off the pages of Holy Writ, and that same process is going on today here at Fairhaven Baptist College, where they've trained you to take the baton. And tonight, we're going to encourage you to grab it, take it, and go for it. I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Passing on the Baton. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight, and for each life represented, whether they be a visitor, a Lord, a relative, a loved one, and of course all the students, we're just grateful to be a part of this wonderful evening tonight. 
And Lord, we're thankful for your call to the ministry. Lord, I thank you for calling me. And Lord, as unworthy as I felt at times, but Lord, I know that you've called me and it's been a privilege and honor to serve you. I don't have to. I get the privilege to do so. And Lord, I pray now tonight as we think about the uh, baton being uh, passed on, Lord, that every graduate would take this serious and hang on to that baton till you come again or till you call them home. Now, Lord, we love you and pray you'd bless the message tonight. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Today in our text uh, is actually full of all kinds of instruction about uh, to whom the next generation we should pass the baton to. So I want to look at three things tonight. But first of all, notice, if you would, the tracing of the stops of Elijah. Now, I had you circle the word, uh, actually, Gilgal there, Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan. But have you ever uh, heard of the term, a a goodbye tour? You've heard that before. Of course, we know when famous athletes or musicians are about to to, uh, retire, they have their goodbye tour. They they make their last appearances at the place that made them famous. Now, this is kind of a sanctified imagination, but in my mind, I view this as a victory tour or a uh, goodbye tour that Elijah is making here. Elijah is on a farewell tour. He's making his last appearances in places where uh, uh, in the past significant things happened in the nation of Israel. Now, I had you circle those four different locations, but first of all, Gilgal is the first place the nation of Israel camped after they crossed the Jordan River uh, and their flight from Egypt. You remember that? Gilgal was also the place the children of Israel uh, placed 12 stones as a memorial so they would not forget God's pre- previous blessing as they left the land of Egypt. Are you still with me tonight? Say amen. You're looking kind of quiet and sleepy there. I heard people at Fairview can sleep with their eyes open. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know people in Seneca can do it. <laughs> Gilgal reminds me, but you know, it's interesting here, but uh, you know, they were free from Egypt, but their battles were not over. And graduates, you know, I, I know there was a struggle to get through school. I struggled to get through here, but your battles aren't over. They're just really beginning. So don't think, well, it's all over now. But Gilgal reminds me of one of the reasons people quit on God after they're saved. It's true that when we get saved, the Lord certainly rolls away the burden of sin. But all life's problems don't roll away after you come to know Christ as your Savior. And all problems don't roll away once you graduate and get your diploma. Let me, let me clue you in. Many young Christians quit on God because they soon discover that life is challenging. Some think once you're saved, all your problems are gone. Now, the approach of Israel was over when they left Egypt, but all their problems were not over. If you read your Bible, you know it. That's true. Nowhere does the Bible teach that your problems are all a thing of the past once you come to faith in Christ. In fact, Jesus said in John 15, verse 20, the servant's not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Listen to what Psalm 34, 19 says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. If you never give up, that is. Now, I'll be honest. I'd rather have problems as a Christian than problems as a result of of a sinful lifestyle. Somebody say amen to that. We got our problem, but they're not nearly as severe as as those caused by by, uh, uh, terrible uh, choices and sinful choices. The second stop in this goodbye tour was Bethel. I had you circle that too. It's found in verse 2, but Bethel is significant because it was there. Jacob, of course, fell asleep and uh, used those stones for a pillow and dreamed that he saw a ladder uh, coming down from heaven. Now, Bethel means the house of God. And I'm going to tell you, graduates, tonight, the devil's going to try to separate you from the house of God, from the local church. Today, God's house, of course, is the local New Testament church where the hymns uh, uh, are sung, hymns of praise. The word of God is preached and tithes received. Here in the in the, is the reason that many Christians quit on God is because they are careless about their church attendance. Hello, come on. When I was a teenager, I, wouldn't, uh, I worked at actually an American Motors car dealership in Wisconsin with my dad. And, and uh, in fact, some of you older folks remember, but back in the 1960s, autos, uh, automobiles need repaired, actually you should say tuned about every 10,000 miles. You change the oil every 3,000 miles. You change the spark plug every, every 10,000 miles. And you change the ignition point. You say, what in the world is that? If you don't know what it is, you're not old enough to know. <laughs> but if the cars weren't well maintained, you ran the risk of the car quitting on it. It's pretty, pretty simple. And here's my point. Every Sunday at church is a time for spiritual maintenance. It really is. In fact, every church service is a spiritual tune-up. 
it takes three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night. Amen? Amen. If you don't do regular maintenance, only a matter of time before you quit on God. And graduates, again, Satan's going to try to separate you from the local church. Somebody will say something you don't like, or maybe the pastor won't do something you appreciate, or who knows what it might be, but the devil will sure makes a, 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 a you know, way for you to try to get out of church. Third stop, of course, on Elijah's goodbye tour we find here was Jericho. It's in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 4. But Jericho was the place the children of Israel marched around the city, of course, one time for six days and seven times on the seventh day. And, of course, the walls fell down. Now, Jericho was called the city of Palm because of the abundance of date palm trees that grew there. Jericho means fragrant. When people visited Jericho, people were greeted by a very sweet and pleasant smell. Not like Mosley, Wisconsin, and the smell of a paper factory. Huh? You've been, you know what I'm talking about. But this is, a, this is a fragrant smell. Jericho reminds me of how nice the devil makes sin appear. Don't miss this, folks. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 17, the adulterous woman, who is a picture of Satan, says these words, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. And I'm saying tonight, many Christians today end up quitting on God because they live so close to the world, so much like the world, they get sucked in. Somebody say Amen. Some years ago, a wealthy man decided he needed a new chauffeur. As he put an ad in the newspaper and included his phone number, he got several calls and he narrowed it down to two gentlemen that he was going to interview. And both candidates were asked the same question and the wealthy man said, if, uh, if you're driving up a mountain road and there are no guardrails, where in the road would you drive? The first candidate said, well, I would drive in the middle of the road in a cage and I'd drive off the edge and take a peek and, and look at the view. The second candidate said, well, I'll always stay as far as a kin away from where danger exists. Obviously, the second man got the job. That's the guy that I want driving for me. And many Christians quit on, quits on God because they live too close to the world. When you leave here, a graduate, you're not going to have someone looking over your shoulder quite so much. And, and uh, you know, they're going to be folks that all oh, the standards are too high and they're too strict. And, and uh, Satan will try to lure you away. The Bible still says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come up among and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. God does that for our good so we don't get sucked in. You've all seen commercial wood choppers, uh, chippers used by the tree companies. Those things scare me. You know, things are noisy, man. Those things scare me. I've heard get sucked into those things, you know. But, you know, in, in a similar way, some live so close to the world, they get sucked into the world. The fourth stop was Jordan. You say, what in the world could that mean? Well, listen, we'll tell you. Amen. But look at this, Jordan, in 2 Kings 2, 16. Jordan means descender, or descending rather, or to go down. Now, a depression in the lay of the land is a place where the elevation dips. You can picture that in your mind. People often want to quit on the Lord and uh, when they're depressed or when the chips are down. There have been times over the years in Seneca, you know, we've seen the chips have been down. And uh, my wife, is, God bless her, she's a wonderful woman. But uh, sometimes she gets discouraged. I've been discouraged. Thank God it's not usually both at the same time, amen? But she said, that's it. Let's get out of here. I said, we can't do that. That's what most people would do. And we're not like most people. We're not leaving on, on the downturn. If we leave, it's on the upturn if we ever leave. I'm saying tonight, Elijah, prior to this some 10 years, you remember, was wore out physically and spiritually, ended up getting caught in the depths of depression, wanted to quit on God and ask God to kill him. And I'm saying tonight, preventative care is always the best measure. I'm not saying rest much, but rest some. Get some refreshment. Don't get burnt out for the Lord. I used to think I wanted to get burnt out when I was about 18, maybe. <laughs> I learned better than that a long time ago. Today, today, I want to wear out for the Lord. I don't want to rust out. I, I don't want to burn out. I want to wear out. Kind of like a quarter horse and a workhorse. A quarter horse is done at about a quarter mile. But the workhorses keep going and going and going and going. I want to be a workhorse for the Lord. Never make a major decision when you're depressed. Don't decide to leave the church you're going to be going to when you're depressed and down in the dumps. Don't do that. That's what most people do. Don't be like most people. We said, first of all, tonight, the uh, tracing of the stops of Elijah. Secondly, notice the testing of the servant of Elijah. There's some good things. Don't miss this. But the testing of the servant of Elijah. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Look at verse number 4. It says, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here. Stay back. 
Twice it says that to him now. I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Look at verse number 6. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Stay here, I'm going to Jordan. And uh, Elisha again, and he said, as the Lord liveth, as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they went, uh, two, uh, two went on. Now Elijah keeps trying to get Elisha uh, to stay behind. And Elisha keeps saying, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Now Elijah was using a tactic. Here's what I want you to see tonight. Elijah was using a tactic on Elisha that God often uses on those that seek to follow him. Don't miss this. I call it the divine tease. What in the world is that? Well, let's look at this. I'm saying God teases us playfully to see if we want to follow him even when he gives us opportunity to turn back. Put a marker there, if you would, in 2 Kings 2, and I want to show you a couple examples. Luke chapter 24. I call it the divine tease. Elijah gave Elisha three opportunities to stay back. Did he want him to stay back? Of course he didn't, but he gave him opportunity. There's a reason why. We'll look at that in a bit. But I call it the divine tease. Jesus also did that. We're looking quickly now in Luke chapter 24. And look at verses 27 through 29. Luke 24, the divine tease. I never read that in the theology book, but that's what I call it. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone. That's Jesus. He's acting like he's going to go farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went into tarry with them. Jesus acted like he was going to keep on going, even though he wanted them to, uh, wanted them to constrain him to stay. We see the same thing actually happening in Mark chapter 6, verse 48. It says this, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. I call that the, the divine tease. Acting like he was going to leave, but really he wanted them to constrain him to stay. Elijah must have known about the divine tease because he gives Elisha three opportunities to stay back but he really wanted Elijah to, follow, Elijah to follow. Now, don't be surprised, graduates, in your Christian life if God doesn't give you opportunity where you can quit on him, quit on him, but he doesn't really want you to. He's really testing or teasing you to see how much you really want to follow him. When I was in high school, I told you I played football. We had a coach named Jim Cahoon. We call him the big Cahooner. <laughs> Not to his face. <laughs> I hope he doesn't get the sermon tonight. <laughs> But anyway, the big kahuna, Coach Cahoon there, uh, actually we, we began football practice in August when it's nice and hot and humid, amen. And we had a practice at 8 in the morning, then we had one at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, after about the first day, he says, anybody that wants mama should quit. He'd say, anybody that's a sissy should quit the team right now. Anybody that doesn't like the sweat should quit. Does anybody like the sweat? I don't think anybody does, but... Anybody that's afraid of getting blistered feet and some bruises, you got to quit today. Just get out the field and take your stuff and go home. Anybody that's afraid to tackle Glenn Bonlander should quit. Glenn Bonlander was about six foot one, weighed 220 pounds. He was a fullback. It was a moose, you know. Did Coach Cahoon really want us to quit? No, but he acted like it because he didn't want anybody on the team that wasn't totally committed. And the reason Elijah gives Elisha three times to quit, he didn't want anybody that wasn't committed. Just be aware of the fact that God will sometimes give you the opportunity. I've had plenty of opportunities to quit over the years, you know. That brings great in Seneca. Well, it's most of the time, but sometimes it's not too much fun, to be honest with you. But let me quickly show you three things God looks for when he desires to pass the baton. And I hope, young folks, you'll measure up to that tonight. First of all, we see here Elisha possessed a persistent loyalty. We find there in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, verse 4, and verse 6, that Elisha says three times, I will not leave thee. Elisha would follow Elijah as long as he followed the Lord. I see he possessed a persistent loyalty. Loyalty is the quality that God places in very high esteem. Loyalty can be defined as faithful adherence to a person, a cause, or a duty. The graduates, we're going to be really profitable to the Lord, you're going to have to have that persistent loyalty. I hope you do. 
Elisha, notice also, Elisha possessed a persistent work ethic. In the book of Acts, the Bible, I'm going to harp a little bit about this a little bit. But in the book of Acts, the, the, the Bible talks about Paul and, and Barnabas being called to the work that God had called them to do. The ministry is work. If you don't like work and you don't have a good work ethic, quit and do something else. Don't go into the ministry and goof up the church you go to. Notice 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 6. Why don't you see some things? The distance from Gilgal to Bethel was at least 7 miles. The distance from Bethel to Jericho was about 12 miles. The distance from Jericho to Jordan was about six miles. Now, if you're a mathematician, you got to figure it out. That's at least 25 miles that Elijah, Elisha followed Elijah on foot on dirty, dusty, sweaty afternoon or whatever time of day it was. But he did that to follow the Lord. If you're not willing to get dirty and sweat a little bit, go do something else. Don't have the union mindset. That's not my job. Anything's our job if, if God calls us to go someplace and help. Elisha also, you see here, third of all, he possessed a persistent dedication to the cause. Three times Elisha says in verse 2, verse 4, verse 6, as the Lord liveth, Elisha was saying, as long as there is a God in heaven, I will not stop following you as long as you follow God. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 58 that says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There are a lot of things you, that you do maybe in life that could be in vain, but if you serve the Lord, it's never in vain. God always keeps track of that. Amen. And you may not get a pat on the back here. You probably won't. <laughs> Elisha was persistently dedicated to the cause. God's careful about whom he hands the baton to. We should be careful about that, too. Well, quickly moving on tonight, we've seen the tracing of the steps of Elijah. We saw the testing of the servant of Elijah, and then last of all tonight, but number three, the transferring of the spirit of Elijah. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Are you still with me here yet? It's awful quiet here tonight. 2 Kings 2, verse 9 says this, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked. What a way to go to heaven, talking to the Lord, and then you get raptured. That's a great way to go, amen. That behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Again, Elijah asked Elisha, what shall I do for thee before I be taken away from thee? Now, my first thought is, wow. <laughs> you think about this. Elijah is speaking on, the, on behalf of the Lord, and he says to Eli, uh, Elisha, what do you want? <laughs> wow. That's a, what a great opportunity. You, you think about that. Wow. Elijah is speaking on God's behalf, offering Elisha a blank check. What would you do if God gave you a blank check? What do you want? Here it is, you know. Elisha does not want a million dollars, folks. He uh, does not want an exotic vacation someplace, doesn't ask for a mansion to live in. Rather, he asks for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And we see from this that a real man of God or a woman of God is not in God's service for money or material gain. They are in it because they want to be used of God. Amen. That would disqualify half the, the TV preachers, by the way. I have often said I didn't go to Seneca to get anything. I didn't go to get anything there. I wasn't trying to get something out of the people. I went there because I wanted to do something for the Lord. That's why I'm still there in Seneca. Not what I can get. And I could have made a ton more money. Actually, if I wasn't a preacher, I'd be a building contractor. If I wasn't a building contractor, I'd be a drag racer. I told you. <laughs> the preacher is the best thing to do, amen. But I could have made a whole lot more money as a building contractor, but I never could have had a better life than the ones God gave me in, in Seneca, Pennsylvania. If you go out where God plants you, you bloom there. God's a great boss. Because Elisha's request was unselfish, God blessed him with his desire. Of course, he got the double portion of, of the Elijah's spirit, twice as many miracles performed. Elijah served about 10 years. Elisha served about 20 years. Wasn't that great? <laughs> Elisha asked for what God desired to give, and God gave it. You know, I love what it says in John 15, 7. 
Jesus said, abide in me in my words. If my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If you get close to the Lord and get into God's word, you'll ask for the right things, and you'll find God very seldom says no. James 4, 3 says, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss or for the wrong thing or for the wrong motive that ye may consume it upon your own lust. One time at a church prayer meeting, a man requested prayer for a family he knew that was having a hard time paying their rent. The preacher asked the man, what's your relation to the family? The man said, I'm the landlord. Come on, think a little bit here. That's asking amiss, amen. There's an ulterior motive there. Now, let me mention a few more things, and we'll wind this thing up, but go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. It says there, And it came to pass, as they still went on, and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up to heaven, uh, into, uh, into heaven by the whirlwind, as it said. Now, Elijah went to heaven not by the chariot of fire. A lot of people think that. He did not go to heaven in the chariot of fire. It separated him and, and Elisha, but he went to heaven in the whirlwind, much like a tornado. That's how he went to heaven, not the chariot of fire. Elijah was departed, uh, but not dead. For approximately 930 years later, he appears with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, and he'll appear again during the tribulation period as one of the two witnesses. Here's my point. Our loved ones that have died that knew Jesus as their Savior are indeed departed, but they have not ceased to exist. That, by the way, those scriptures kind of put the gabosh on soul sleep. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians, I should say 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, it says we are confident, which means completely convinced, and I say willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That reminds me of a story. <laughs> back, oh, I guess it's several years back now, but my granddaughter Esther was about, well, she's 13 now, and she was four years old at the time, but she was asked to be a flower girl for a wedding to one of our church girls down in Butler, Pennsylvania. Because she was part of the wedding party, she had to be there early, and, and I told Esther before she left, I said, Grandpa will be coming a little bit later. When Pauline and I arrived, the pastor meets me in the parking lot, and he says, your granddaughter keeps saying, my grandpa's coming, my grandpa's coming, my grandpa's coming, my grandpa's coming. Now, I wasn't there yet, but in her mind, if Grandpa said he was coming, it was a fact. She was confident Grandpa was coming. And that's the confidence we should have about our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. They're, they're departed, but they did not cease to exist. Paul said we are confident, we're not doubting, that absent the body is present with the Lord. Now Elijah, as I said earlier, departed some 930 years prior when he appears with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, but he also fulfills Malachi's prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, where Elijah would appear before the great and dreadful day of the Lord or the battle of Armageddon. And then in Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 12, it says, come up thither and they ascend up to heaven in a cloud. There's a very important truth here. Elijah is the only person in the Bible that gets raptured twice. Think about that a little bit. Now I'll be satisfied to be raptured once, amen. <laughs> but Elijah was going to be raptured twice. There's more I could say, but let's, uh, let's close up here. Close your Bibles. I have a story I want to tell. We'll be done. You're supposed to say amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you forgot from last night. Okay. Well, Runner's World Magazine, I'm not into Runner's World Magazine, but I've caught this article. But back in August of 1991, told the story of Beth Ann DeChantis, who attempted to qualify the 1992 Olympic trials in the marathon. A female runner must complete the 2685 yard race in less than two hours and 45 minutes to make the Olympic team. Now, Beth started out strong, but began having trouble about mile 23. She reached the final straightway at 243 with just two minutes left to qualify. 200 yards from the finish, she stumbled and fell, dazed and stayed down for 20 seconds. The crowd yelled, get up, get up, get up. The clock was ticking, 244, less than a minute to go. Beth Ann staggered to her feet, began walking, fell actually five yards short of the finish. With 10 seconds to go, she, she fell again. She began to crawl. You can picture that. The crowd cheering her on and crossed the finish line on her hands and knees. Her time, two hours, 44 minutes, and 57 seconds. She only had three seconds to spare. But here's what I want you to think about. She was determined to reach her goal and finish on time, and she did. 
And that same resolve is needed by every Christian. Graduates, tonight, that's the determination you need. We have a race to run, and time is running out. Jesus is coming soon. Graduates, tonight, here's the baton. Please don't drop it. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we're thankful for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for your word. It's quick and powerful. And Lord, I preach to myself tonight. And by your grace and help, we're not going to let the baton drop until Jesus comes again or he calls us home. And Lord, these young folks are just beginning their life. And I know you've got many wonderful plans for them. I know the devil's got plans to trip them up and to goof their lives up. But Lord, I pray they'd walk close to you. And Lord, if they'll do that uh, in the years to come, we'll hear of many wonderful things that you've done through your lives, through their lives. And Lord, again, we love you and thank you for calling us to do something so wonderful with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. exalted forever and ever, God of eternity, the ancient of days, wondrous in wisdom, majestic in glory, perfect in holiness, and worthy of praise. Be thou exalted, be thou exalted, and Savior of sinful man, Redeemer and King, one with the Father, co-equal in glory, humbly we come to Thee, our homage to bring. Be Thou exalted, Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels, Be thou Exalted, O Spirit of power, dwelling within our hearts to keep us from sin. God of the ages and Lord of salvation, ruler of heaven and earth, thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted, be thou exalted, by seraphs and Be the glory forever, amen, amen, forever, amen. This time, it's my pleasure to present to you the graduating class of Fairhaven Christian Academy for the year 2019. Mandy Brader. Nathan Patrick. Emily Reinhardt.
Andrew Schreiber. Elisha Wright. Jonathan Wright. Let's give them all a round of applause. It is my pleasure to present to you the graduating class of Fairhaven Baptist College for the year 2019. The following student is receiving a song leading certificate, Jonathan Ansley. The following students are receiving a Bible certificate, Timothy Borley. Caleb Hallman. Sarah Hallman. Stephanie Maley. Katie Payton. Jenna Wilson. The following student is receiving a secretarial diploma, Kayla Scrignoli. The following students are receiving a Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education, Morgan Hall. Joanna Mitchell. The following student is receiving a Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education. Joy Zadarsky. The following student is receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Missions, Amanda Frucci. The following students are receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Theology and Music, Ben Martin. Mike Santusi. The following student is receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Theology, Jim Hunt. The following student is receiving a Master of Education, Sean Mayville. Give them all a round of applause. All right, before we dismiss, I have one other thing to do. So, Pastor Williams, if you could just sit down here with your wife real fast. Just come right over here. Mrs. Williams, if you could scoot in here, and you'll understand in just a moment, Pastor Williams, so if you could join your wife right there, and we have the screen ready and the lights, and I have a short uh, two-part video presentation, and so this is part one, and then I'll come up, give a little explanation, and then there'll be part two. My name is Abe Williams, uh, oldest child of uh, Larry and Pauline Williams, this is my wife, Joanne. Been married uh, 20 years come June, and uh, I would like to read a verse of Second Chronicles 31, 20, and 21. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God, and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. And I think those verses sum up my father and his ministry very well. Uh, some of my uh, my cousin one time said, uh, Uncle Larry, I think of three things when I think of you. 
I think of work, spankings, and church. And that about sums up my father. Um, we came come to Pennsylvania in 1981, and my father had $40 to his name, uh, a two-year-old son, and a three-month-old three daughter, and a 1966 four-door Rambler um, with no job, and, but uh, he knew the Lord had called him here. And, uh, you know, 30-some years later, he's still here, and with the blessing of God on his ministry, he uh, likes to often say that he, uh, it's like carving something out of granite. But um, he's been faithful, and God has used him in an out-of-the-way place um, with many times little or no resources. But uh, God has showed himself strong on our behalf and has uh, made Faith Baptist a light in our community. When I think of Pastor Williams, the word that came to my mind, Pastor and Mrs. Williams, is faithful. And through the faithful ministry of Pastor and Mrs. Williams, I think of the impact that they've had. And I thought, first of all, personal impact. Uh, when I came here in 1995 to where I am now, the growth and maturity in my Christian walk and faith is in large part due to their ministry. Then I think of our church. I think one of the biggest testaments to um, pastor's ministry is our church family, our core church family. Mm -hmm. When I think of how many of us have been 20 years more or less working together, serving together, giving together, um, being involved in outreaches together. I think that shows something about pastor's uh, efforts here. And then I think in the community, whether it's with visitation or uh, we go to camps, we <clears throat> obviously give a lot to missions and all of those things. And I just think, I wonder how many thousands of lives have been impacted by the gospel of Christ. I recently heard that ministry is not something that we do for God. It is something that God does through us. And um, I sincerely hope that um, that God will be glorified through the faithful ministry of Pastor and Mrs. Williams. In just a moment, I'm going to show you a little slide presentation of the work there in Seneca in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And verse 17, it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And uh, we appreciate Pastor Williams and his wife and their work. And so this is a little bit of their work in Seneca, Pennsylvania. I had to throw the car in there, all right? That's one of my favorite pictures, all right? He let me drive that thing, all right? But um, we appreciate Pastor Williams and his wife. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, 
endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. It is our honor to have Pastor Williams as a graduate, and uh, we wanted to tonight, uh, and an earned doctorate, uh, I just finished that up, I was telling the church that, earned doctorate at my age, that's what you get, all right? Uh, you don't get a uh, you don't get an honorary doctorate. An honorary doctorate comes from the School of Hard Knocks. All right? it's, it's earned through a lot of years of preaching the word, being instant in season and out of season. And so uh, we, we're not going to give Mrs. Williams, we're going to give you some roses. Okay, so if you guys will come on, step on up here. And then for Pastor Williams, and I believe his church actually may be watching right now. They asked when we were doing this, and so they wanted to see us. I don't know why. I, I don't. Do they like you? All right. Do they? All right. <laughs> um, but we're we're gonna give him from Prairie Baptist College an honorary doctorate of divinity. And so I appreciate Dr. Williams and his wife, and I appreciate his stand for the Word of God. And so uh, it is now Dr. Larry Williams. together and sing God Bless America together. God bless America. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for sending your son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we thank you for this evening. And again, Lord, we're um, really just filled with gratefulness when we think about um, your grace and what it's done for each young person that's represented here. Lord, we're filled with anticipation about the future. Lord, I pray that you would arm each of our graduates with a real commitment to your word, commitment to be faithful, Lord, understanding that in times of uh, difficulty, they can run to you, and Lord, you'll be their refuge. Lord, I pray that uh, for each one, it will be said when they look back on their life that they finish their course with joy. Again, Lord, I pray that you'd send all the way with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 